We have this room in our house. I wonder if you have a room like this where we, we put all the stuff in that we don't know what to do with. Like, it's not stuff we want to get rid of. We just, we just don't know what to do with it. So we put it in a room and we shut the door and we don't really go in there. And we, we really wanted to keep it shut. Like if we have company over, we don't want people to see in there because we just, we don't want to throw it away. We just kind of shove it in that room and, and uh, leave it there. And I think that's how a lot of Christians think, thinks about some topics, think about some topics in the Bible, especially the topic of hell. You know, we'd rather just put the topic of hell like, you know, in a room somewhere and, and keep it shut because, you know, keep it hidden in a room somewhere. You know, it's like the skeleton in God's closet. You know, like he's a really good guy, you know, once you get to know him. He's kind of got this evil, you know, vengeful streak on him. Like he just get angry every once in a while. So we just kind of keep that away. And it's kind of this skeleton in his closet. And this became a, um, known to me, a reality for me, I guess maybe... Uh, is 24 years ago when, when Jesus came into my life and kind of in, uh, turned my life upside down or maybe, maybe downside up. And, and um, I, I remember like going and, you know, hell wasn't a barrier for me, but I remember going and talking to a friend about Jesus and they're like, oh, you think I'm going to go to hell? I'm like, whoa, 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 I didn't say anything about hell. Like, what do you, what's going on here? And, uh, and what I found in these past years is like, this is, this is a subject uh, that, that's sensitive for people. And this is one of the questions that a lot of uh, people who may be exploring Christianity or new Christians, they wonder like, hey, what, how, what, is, what is God up to? And so in the next few weeks, we're doing a series called Reply All, where we're just answering some of these questions that new Christians or people exploring Christianity may have. And, and this is a big one. And, and, and I want to help. I want to help if this is you, like you have this question, or maybe this isn't a barrier for you, but you, you definitely know people where this is a question. So I want to help you, not necessarily by answering all your questions, because that's not going to happen. This is a big topic. This is not a comprehensive talk on hell. In fact, I, I guarantee you at the end of this talk, you'll probably say something like, well, what about, or what, what about the, and, and you're not all your questions are good answered, but here's my hope and here's my goal, which is kind of audacious, I think, uh, is that I want to give you confidence. I want to give you solid reasons why hell is not, simply, uh, is not simply a paradox of his goodness, but it's a manifestation of his goodness. It's not a paradox of his goodness. It is the manifestation of his goodness. And I'm looking at you and you don't believe me, but we'll, we'll see what happens at the end. One of the big issues that we face in understanding the topic of hell is that we have this caricature of hell. Like we have this caricature of the biblical story. And, and that's what we really need to do. We need to get, a, uh, get our mind upon, um, my wife is smiling because we talked about the pronunciation, of the pronunciation of this word before this. And so she's, did I get it right? Oh, I did? Very good. Um, we, we don't really understand the full biblical story. And so here's the big, this is what most people think. You know, you're, you're, you're walking on earth and, and if you're good, you know, one day God's going to beam you up into the sky, into the clouds. And, and if you're bad, you know, there'll be this big trap door that will, you know, open up and you'll fall into the flames of hell. And that's basically like people believe that. And this is problematic on several different um, levels. And, and part of it is, is that we only experience earth now. Like we don't experience any heaven or hell now because the Bible talks about it differently. Or the, other, or the other issue is that we don't experience earth in the future. And so heaven and hell are like these two counterparts, right? They're like vying for our eternal destiny. You know, who's going to win? You've got the opposite end over here. You know, you've got the positive side of the battery over here. You've got the negative side of the battery over here. Like they're these two co-equal parts. But this is not how the Bible talks about heaven and hell. In fact, if you were to do a search on Bible Gateway, which is just a you know, Bible app, Bible website. If you were to type in the words heaven and hell, and you were to find, okay, how, how many verses are in the Bible that have both heaven and hell? You might be surprised to find out that there are zero verses in the Bible about heaven and hell together. Now, there's a lot of verses in the Bible about heaven. There's a lot of verses in the Bible about hell, but the Bible does not pair them together. Now, if you were to type in the words heaven and earth, you would get about 200 hits on that search, uh, depending on your translation. The Bible does not pair heaven and hell. It pairs heaven and earth. And one of the reasons, and this is so important, one of the reasons why we get hell wrong is that we get heaven and earth wrong, that we don't understand the big picture of what God is doing on earth. So what I want to do today is I want to to explain the big picture of what God is doing on earth and what's going on with uh, heaven and earth, and that will lead into a talk about hell. So here it is. In the beginning, 
Heaven and earth were created in Eden. And Eden was a place where God's manifest presence, where he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, that, that uh, in a sense, uh, earth and, and heaven were together. Everything was as we think it should be. And it, you know, it was God's goodness on display in high definition. But we brought sin into the world. Now, sin is just defined as going our own way, not trusting God, believing the lie of the enemy uh, that said, you know, said to Adam and Eve, like, hey, don't trust God. He's hiding something behind his back. He doesn't want your good, but I do, so come follow me. And so sin is not trusting God, it's going our own way. This rebellion tore heaven and earth apart, separated uh, heaven and earth. And so even God putting angels in front of Eden, separating the two. And sin, the sin that we brought into the world, unleashed evil into the world at varying different levels, at the systematic level, war, genocide, sex trafficking, just wreaked havoc on our world, as well as the individual level, you know, lust, pride, anger, greed, murder. And this sin is the spark that sets God's world on in flames. And it, it, we are the ones that brought in destructive power of sin. And this is one of the reasons why God hates sin. He is not indifferent towards sin because he's not indifferent towards you and I. Sin rots out our soul. It rots out the souls of our family. It rots out the, rots out the souls of our nation. It does so much destruction, carnage, decay, and death. God would be most cruel if this didn't bother him. He is not indifferent towards sin. Um, but he wants to deal with sin. So what does God do about it? What is God's response to the rebellion and rupture of his world? Well, in the gospel, what we don't see, God doesn't take the earth, you know, and kind of like put it in his cosmic trash bin. He's not like, hey, you know, I'll, you know, I'll, you know, I'll concede the, the, the world to somewhere else. He says, no, the kingdom of heaven is breaking into earth. That's what the incarnation is about. Jesus stepping into our destruction and say, I am coming back. I'm coming to restore you. I'm coming to restore the world. He's bringing reconciliation and restoration through Christ. This is, again, what the incarnation is about. God coming to man, heaven coming to earth. He preached the heaven, the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is here because I am here. And this is what his plan is up to. In the end, heaven and earth are destined for reconciliation. So in Ephesians 1, it says, in him, that is Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom, making known. He wants to make this known. He doesn't want it to be a secret, like something he's hiding. He wants to make us known. The mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. So he's basically saying, I want to make this known. Here's my plan. Here's my purpose. It's all through Christ as a plan for the full of time, this is the point of history, to unite, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on the earth. This is what he's doing. He's making it plain. He just said it right there. He says something very similar to the church in Colossae. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So everything, God is in Christ. God is, Christ is God. And through Christ, to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus is the savior that reconciles heaven and earth. And he is the one that makes peace on the war that we have waged on earth, against earth. We are the one who's waged war against God, excuse me. And he is the one who makes peace. And we are the ones that that's through our sin that tore apart heaven and earth. And this is what God's plan is up to. He wants to unite all things to himself. He wants to bring together heaven and earth. And he wants to reconcile sinful man with holy God. That's what he wants to do. What is separated, he wants to bring together. This is central to his plan. And it's central to our mission as a church, the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. What he doesn't say is all authority in heaven is given to me. So I'll see you when you get there. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go tell them, go tell them that I'm reconciling heaven and earth. Go tell them that I'm bringing the light and I'm banishing the darkness. 
This is the hope of the gospel. And it's a thread that we see all through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, in Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, it says, there were loud voice in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He's not giving up on earth. He's not like saying, okay, devil, you can have the earth. I'll go play somewhere else. He is reconciling the earth and heaven together, and he's reconciling you and I together with him in his presence. This is something that creation is longing for. Romans 8 says that that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. It's longing to be set free. It's under the sway of sin and there's tornadoes and earthquakes and it's longing for that day. Creation itself is looking for that day when God will reconcile heaven and earth together. But it's not just earth, and we're included, not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits, that's important, of the spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's why things don't taste the way that we think they should taste. That's why we're wildly disappointed. We have this idea of what life should be like and we never quite get there. We inwardly groan for this life to come. And it says that we have the first fruits, which means that we're actually able to taste something of heaven now by his spirit. Not fully, but we're able to taste something of heaven now. And guess what? We're also able to taste something of hell now. The destructive powers of hell, the hatred, the loneliness, the depression, the anger, the racism, all of it. God's hope is that we would be redeemed and creation would be redeemed. Prophets speak about this all the time. So like Isaiah says, that he'll make a desert into a valley of roses. He'll make sweet wine from the, from the mountains. The lion and the lamb will, will lay down together in a renewed world where heaven and earth are reconciled. The African theologian Augustine said this in the fourth century, I believe. This, he wrote a book called The City of God, comparing it to the city of, of man in, uh, in Rome. And he's looking out at the Mediterranean Sea and he says, in, if this is the beauty afforded to sinful men, what does God have in store for those who is redeemed? We see that in Revelation 21, I've hinted at this already. And he says, this, John has this revelation of, this, of, this, of what's happening at the end of time. He says, and I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, um, from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself be with them as their God. A few important observations. Notice the direction. This isn't God taking us to heaven. This is God bringing heaven to us. The city is coming down. You know, it's not like, hey, get me out of here. Beat me up, Scotty. Like he's he's coming to us. The other thing I want you to notice is is the is the marriage imagery. What, What do marriage what do weddings celebrate? They celebrate union. They celebrate two people becoming one. He's like, this is heaven and earth are coming together. Uh, uh, My people and and me are coming together. They will be my people and God himself will be their God. This wedding between heaven and earth, two being united, becoming one forever. So when you with this storyline in place for what God is doing, wants to do with heaven and earth and how how the separation started and how God is gonna bring back wholeness and oneness, the implicit logic of hell begins to make sense. And it's no longer a contradiction of God's goodness, but I think you'll see here in a minute the manifestation manifestation of God's goodness. Because to long for the dawning of the light is to long for the banishment of darkness. To long for the healing of the body is to hope for the removal of the disease. To pray with Jesus, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, is to by nature pray for the banishment of all rebellion and evil. You know, there's going to be a day where God, he's creating a world where he's not going to let anything make you cry. He's not going to let anything make you sad. He's not going to let anything cause you to be depressed 
are lonely, are hated. He's making a new world and he wants you to be a part of it. God is on a mission to get the hell out of earth. Not, God is on a mission to get hell out of earth. Not God is on a mission to get hell out of earth. God is on a mission to get hell out of earth. God is not trying to get people to hell. He's trying to get hell out of people. He's trying to remove this. In the gospels, we are the one that have unleashed the destructive power of sin in the world. In the mercy of God, he has not, he has not allowed this to ultimately you know, give us over ultimately to our destruction, but he's holding it together, reconciling heaven and earth, God and his people. He is so committed to this that he himself would enter our own destruction. He would take on skin and bone, that he'd walk, move into the neighborhood, that he would be crucified between two thieves, that he would die for our sin, paying the price, making a way where there was no way. So the question is, so the question is, is when God kicks out evil, where does it go? Does it go it's like under the ground? Do we, is hell somewhere under the ground? Well, in the, in the New Testament, the location of hell is not under the earth. It's outside the city. And this is important. It's not under the earth in some like underground torture chamber. It's outside the city. It's outside the presence. You know, in Jerusalem, there was a temple where the presence of God was and it was outside that city. And it was an actual place called the Valley of Hinnah or Gehenna was Jesus' primary word for hell. It's an actual place. Like, you know, if they had Google Maps, you could, you know, you could find it there. And it was an actual place. Uh, it had a dark and ugly history. It was loaded. Um, it was this, this location was just had tons of uh, meaning to it. It was originally the first time we hear about this place in the Old Testament it was, a, it was a place of idol worship to foreign gods. It would, they, would leave, they, they would go outside the city to go worship foreign gods, kind of like that cheap hotel on the outside of the city. But it eventually became a place of not just idolatry, but injustice, as they would sacrifice their own children into the flames um, to these foreign gods. And it eventually, in Jesus' day, became the town landfill where everything unwanted, including the dead bodies of criminals, would go. And it was... It was, it was um, consuming what was in there. And it was, it would just, there was a fire that never went away. So this place called Gehenna, hell, was synonymous with idolatry, with injustice and eternal destruction. Um, and this is the picture that, that Jesus gives in the New Testament. What does this teach us about hell? Well, it teaches us a few things. Number one, yes, hell is a cruel place, but it is not cruel because God is cruel. It is cruel, first of all, because of our own idolatry, putting something else at the center. So in Romans 1, uh, Paul says it this way. He says, although they knew God, that is us, humanity, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and the birds and the animals and the creepy things. Basically saying they made these little statues and they worshiped them. Now you and I don't do that. We don't worship little statues, but we have things that we make ultimate. We make relationships ultimate. We make money ultimate. We make career ultimate. We make education ultimate. There are things that we put at the center that we, leave, we, we ignore the presence of God and we go away from him to, to make something else the center. And that is what he's talking about. But this place called Gehenna was not just a place of idolatry. It was a place of injustice. And Paul explains why. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to their debased mind to do what ought not be done. And in the Israel's case, sacrifice their children. But idolatry leads to all the injustice that we see in the world, the murder, the hate, um, all the things that we would say, this is not good. This is evil. This is wrong. This is what it leads to. And the story of history is that God has made, uh, God made heaven and earth for us to harmoniously live together. God's presence and human beings meant to live together in harmony. Our sin fractured that, separated the two, but Jesus is coming back and he's going to bring heaven and earth back together again. And he's going to banish all evil where it came from, which is outside the walls of Jerusalem in a place called Gehenna, a place called hell. He's gonna hand them over into the mess that they have made, that we have made. And he's going to protect his creation from rebellion and injustice. 
He's going to protect his creation from rebellion. He's going to make sure that nothing makes you cry ever again. He's going to make sure that nothing ever hurts you ever again. He's going to protect the city. And we all have people that we think shouldn't be included in, in our lives or even on this earth. I mean, today's 9-11 and 21 years ago, planes hit the towers, planes went into the Pentagon. And I don't know when that was, 2008, 2009, when Osama bin Laden was killed, we didn't have a day of mourning. You, you see pictures, people in the White House celebrating, high-fiving each other. We did it. We got rid of him. We, we excluded him from the earth. Uh, even the queen. I mean, there's like debate on whether or not you know, was the queen, is it good that the queen is gone or here? Some of that going on. Now, my point is, I don't want to get into that, but my point is, is we all have a list of people that we don't think should be in and of people that we do think should be in. But who gets to choose? I've got great news for you. The one who chooses is also the one who died for you. the one that loved you so much that he did not want you to become the victim of your own sin. But he stood in the gap and he went to the cross for you. He's gonna protect you. This is all throughout the Bible. Again, Isaiah eleven nine. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. Notice this picture of heaven where full knowledge of God exists. Right now we know in part, we see in part, then we'll fully know and it will be a place where he will not let sin hurt or destroy you ever again. Zechariah 2, 4, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude and livestock in it. This, this place where he wants multitudes in. He wants lots and lots of people. In fact, he's like, man, you got to kick the walls down to make room for more people, which today we're like, man, that's so awesome. To ancient people, it's like, God, what are you doing? Those walls protected us from invasion, from attack, from our enemy. God's like, I got you. He says, I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. God protects his city and his people with his presence. His presence inside the city is majestic glory. His presence outside the city is protective fire. He reconciles the heaven and earth. He's creating this place, no tears, no death, no war, and he protects it from unrepentant sin and evil and rebellion. God is not evil for protecting his city, he is good. Paul says it this way to the Thessalonians. He says in uh, this is second letter, chapter one, verse nine, they will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. Away from the presence of the Lord. If hell means anything, it means awayness. It means outside. It means away from his presence. The invitation though, and this is, this is where I wanna land. The invitation a scripture is that the gates to this new city, the gates of heaven have been kicked wide open. And the question for all of us is, will we enter this? Heaven is not full of people who have done, have done good and hell is full of people who've done bad. The, the city of heaven is full of people who have, who have trusted Jesus and repented of their sin and said, yeah, I'm part of, I'm part of the problem. Uh, Jesus does judge our sin, but he also died for our sin. His wrath is warranted, but his wrath is also absorbed in Jesus. Like he took that for us. And, um, and then the Bible word for us is that we need to repent, that we need to change our direction. We need to go in a different way. The hell was not created for us. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Um, there's a movie in the late 80s. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Have you seen that movie? Anybody? No one? Okay. Um, I don't really, I, I don't remember all of it, so I'm not recommending it. But I do remember this one scene. That, that the big idea is that there's this unlikely pair, Steve Martin and John Candy, unlikely pair. And they get grouped together because they're, 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 the plane was delayed or redirected. And they had to get from Wichita to back to Chicago, planes, trains, and automobiles. And they took all these different paths and they have all these different mi mishaps and they drive through up into Chicago. They actually have a big scene in, in St. Louis if, if you haven't seen the movie. 
Um, but they're, I think they're in Illinois and they're, they're on the highway. It's late at night and um, they pull off to get some gas. And they, get, they exit off uh, and they get gas and they're getting ready to exit um, back onto, uh, onto the on-ramp. But instead of going onto the on-ramp, they make a mistake and they go back down the exit ramp, going in the opposite direction of traffic. Now, they initially didn't think it was a big deal because there's no, you know, it's two or three in the morning and there's no cars happening. So they thought everything was fine. So they're driving along. Then all of a sudden, there's a car going in the, in the, in the, in the flow of traffic on the other side of the median. And they yell out the window, you're going the wrong way. You're Pull over, stop, you're going the wrong way. And John Candy, who is not known for his wisdom in this movie, says, well, how do they know which way I'm going? And Steve Martin's like, uh, yeah, how do they know which way they're going? And they start making fun of these people who are warning them like, oh, they've been drinking a little too much. They're a little crazy, how, you know? And then as, as soon as they say that, all of a sudden, here comes a semi. Ephesians 2 says this. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. You're going the wrong way. Jesus talks about hell more than anyone in the New Testament. He's warning, you're going the wrong way. Well, how do you know which way I'm going? How do you know what I want for my life? You're going the wrong way. You need to repent. You need to change your direction. You need to come. You are, you are headed outside the city. You're going to that place of idolatry. You're going to that place of injustice. You're going to that place for eternal destruction. You are following the devil and his angels to a place of death. You are going the wrong way. Stop, turn around and go in the other direction. Come to my city. Come to this new heavens and new earth. Come to this place that I have prepared for you. And I'm so much so that I was willing to die for you. Romans 2, 4, this, we, we, this gets quoted a lot, but it gets misquoted because the verses are the verse that we quote is God's kindness is meant to lead to repentance. So we should be kind to each other. That's not really what that verse is all about. And it says in verse four, it says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? In other words, you're like, you're like these two guys in this movie. You're driving along. You're like, what's the problem? How do they know which way I'm going? Everything seems fine. My life is fine. I've got a good job. I'm doing well. And I seem pretty happy. I'm not going the wrong way. I'm going the way I want to go. Don't presume upon the kindness of God. His kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. He's trying to tell you, you are going the wrong way way. And he has his invitation to this new city, this new place, and he wants you to be a part of it. There's this uh, place in, in Matthew 22. It's this imagery that Jesus gives. He tries to tell all these different stories and all these different ways to give imagery to, to this new thing that he's doing and this new place that he wants to take people to. And so it, it, it gets talked about this wedding feast, the, the wedding feast of the lamb. And so he says to his followers in Matthew 22 says, go therefore in the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. This is the heart of God. The heart of God is that he wants to invite as many people as possible, as many as you find. And check this out. It says, and those servants went out into the roads and they gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. They went out and gathered all that they could, both good and and bad. How do you, how can you participate in this new thing that God's going on? Oh, you, oh, the good people go to heaven and the bad people go to hell. So if you're saying I'm going to hell, you're saying I'm a bad person. He invites the good and the bad. The key isn't being good. The key is saying yes to the invitation. That's who gets to go. It's yes to the invitation. He is inviting people. And that's what, what ends up happening. He says, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. There is an invitation. Jesus has an invitation to this new city, this new Jerusalem. And the question for all of us is, do you want to come? Do you want to be a part of this? 
We, in, our, in ourselves, in, in our own understanding and wisdom, we are headed the wrong way. We're headed outside the city. We're headed toward idolatry. We're headed toward injustice. We're headed toward destruction. And Jesus wants to invite us back in. He's saying, I am building, I'm creating a new thing. I'm bringing heaven to earth. I'm reconciling them. And I want you to be a part of new reconciliation work. And I'm gonna protect this city. Inside this will be a display of my own glory. Outside of it will be a protective fire. I won't let anything hurt you. I will, I will, everything sad will become untrue. I want to take you. Will, you. will you come with me? And that's the question for us. Would you stand? I want, to, I want to pray for us. Jesus, I'm so amazed at your grace. God, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the villain. I'm not the villain just of you. I'm the, I'm the villain of myself. I was following the ways of this world, son, son of disobedience, following the devil, the world, my own flesh, but you, God, made me alive. God, I pray that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened to your goodness and grace, that you long to, to rescue people. You long to rescue people. You long to rescue people from their hell, from their sin. Your invitation is to come, sit at my table, come inside the city, Come inside the new Jerusalem and feast. It's prepared. Everything's been taken care of. Just accept my invitation. Accept my invitation. God, I thank you that you will protect this city. You'll protect it from everything that would seek to invade it. God, would you open our eyes? And God, would you launch your church out? Would you launch us? Would you launch me out in this search and rescue mission to be light, to be salt, to go and declare the king has come. He is bringing the light and he is kicking out darkness. Everything sad will become untrue. He will wipe away your tears. He will create a, a place free from sin and death and destruction. You are a good God. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your forbearance of me. God, we don't want to presume upon that kindness, God, but we want it to fuel repentance and pursuit of you. And I pray this in your name. Amen.